and it'll be recorded on English and Spanish for the county's YouTube channel. Um, Spanish subtitles are not available now, but will be generated via YouTube um, in the recording after the workshop. For use of the trans, uh, chat box, some of you have already done this, but please continue to introduce yourself in the chat and rename your Zoom title, name, pronouns, and organization. You may also submit questions and comments throughout, and the organizers will respond at the appropriate time. Um, I'm going to ask our organizers to put in a workshop accessibility guide. Um, this is available in English and in Spanish, just in case you need any help with um, tech and logistics throughout. Okay, now I wanna turn it over to Gary, LA County's Chief Sustainability Officer for the official welcome. Yeah, thank you all so much for being here today. It's real. Uh, honor to be able to uh, present the findings of our climate vulnerability assessment and it's, it's great to see so many people uh, that are that are joining us on this Thursday afternoon before a holiday. So I want to just say thanks to all of you and I'll start with uh, just uh, as we do in the Chief Sustainability Office always acknowledging uh, and, and honoring and showing our respect for uh, the first people of this ancestral and unceded territory that's, that's called Los Angeles. We, we, we want to recognize the past and present members of the Tongva, Tatavam, Chumash, and Quiche tribes who are part of our community, and we want to offer our respects to their elders. I also want to uh, start by just really acknowledging um, uh, and making a comment about the historic systemic and ongoing racism that exists here in Los Angeles. I don't think we could hold a, a conversation like this without first acknowledging that, you know, from our, from the chief sustainability office's standpoint, we understand that the systemic racism that enables police brutality is actually the same driving force behind racial inequities that are evident all across aspects of our daily lives from disproportionate health impacts uh, that we saw in particular with related to the pandemic, but even more broadly, um, discrimination uh, in housing and employment, uh, unequal outcomes in education, and of course, disproportionate pollution uh, burdens. It's tragic and actually just plain wrong that 25% of black children suffer from asthma in Los Angeles County. And that's a number that's three times higher than for white children. And, and we need to acknowledge and, and, and recognize that that's not by accident, but by design in the way that we have deliberately put freeways, toxic facilities like refineries and other burdens in communities of color. So we need to acknowledge these facts and commit ourselves to actively fighting against racism. And I'm, I'm proud that the County of Los Angeles has now invested in the Anti-Racism Diversity and Inclusion Initiative, which is a sister office to ours here in the Chief Executive Office. And we wanna support and uplift their work. And then as we start to talk about climate vulnerability, I don't think we can also just ignore where we are and seeing the, 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 the heat dome as it's called in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we know that heat kills and we, we're seeing the devastating impacts of, of those extreme temperatures in the Pacific Northwest. We also are seeing wildfires uh, already in California uh, and those are, are uh, 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 in large in number and only going to grow and we're going to continue to see uh, experience loss of life um, property we're going to see people evacuated from their homes and we're all going to be facing soon enough i'm sure uh, the impacts of, of wildfire smoke and uh, so these are these are part of the circumstances that led us to this climate vulnerability assessment uh, we're also facing as as you all know epic drought conditions. Uh, the governor has already declared 41 of the counties, 50 uh, of the 58 counties in the state as in a drought emergency. And this is leading to, to, to water rationing, early cutoffs for farms, tree die-offs, and actually dangerously low water levels in our reservoirs that we rely on for hydroelectric power. 
So the, the climate vulnerability uh, is meant to take this general knowledge about uh, the changes that we're experiencing and actually project down to the local level what we're likely to see here um, in terms of actual climate hazards by mid-century. And you know, that's not always an easy thing to face, but I, I wanna say that you know, this pathway is not set in stone. It doesn't have to be as bad as what we may, uh, may be projecting because we still have the power to make change and to, to change these outcomes. We can take action to drastically reduce uh, air and climate pollution uh, by, by accelerating our transition to clean renewable energy, by converting our transportation systems uh, and our buildings away from fossil fuels, and, and quite frankly, by redesigning our communities. Uh, and so a lot of these will not only mitigate the impacts of climate change, but actually make our communities better, stronger, more resilient uh, as we adapt to the, the changes that, that we're likely to see. Um, so I want to I want to have that hopeful note that it's not too late, and we can we can certainly and, and need to take action. So with that, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna introduce Ricardo Lara, who's here um, with us by video. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to join in person, but as you probably all know, uh, Ricardo Lara was elected as California's insurance commissioner in 2018. And I will note that he made history in doing so by becoming the first openly gay person ever elected to a statewide office in California. And prior to his, his uh, election to the California Insurance Commissioner, he served for eight years in the California Assembly and Senate, uh, where uh, I first met him as part of a California delegation to the UN Climate Conference. Now, he's led a lot of efforts in response to the climate crisis. So I just want to point out a couple. Um, he's certainly working with the insurance industry to be part of the solution. He wrote the first climate insurance law, SB 30. Um, and within the uh, uh, office of the Department of Insurance, he created a climate and security branch, which is the first such branch dedicated to climate and sustainability. Uh, in a Department of Insurance anywhere in the nation. So with that, I introduce... Uh, Once um, again, in the midst of inviting me today. Sorry about that, Gary. I'll start it nope. right now. No, we'll go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me today. As you all know, climate change is exacerbating inequities in our society. It's our seniors, our children, our immigrants, and our low-income communities who will be hurt the most with the increase in extreme heat waves like we've already faced this year. Los Angeles is once again in the midst of multiple heat waves. Climate vulnerability assessments are a critical piece of our approach to climate change. This is personal for me because I grew up in East Los Angeles in a basin with some of the worst air quality in the United States. These are also the conditions in many cities around the world. And when heat waves hit, these communities do not have the air conditioning or the green spaces to mitigate a heat wave. When I was a kid, we used to sleep on the front porch during hot evenings to try to avoid the heat. As a legislator, I authored the California Cooling Act, which promotes climate smart refrigerants and air conditioners, reducing HFC emissions that are tens to thousands of times more potent than carbon dioxide. As your insurance commissioner, we launched the Climate Insurance Working Group, focusing on policies to address risks and impacts from extreme heat, along with wildfire, flood, and sea level rise. Assessing risk and impacts to people is essential because we can focus mitigation resources to protect people and their homes from climate intensified events. The Climate Insurance Working Group has been considering the following questions. How do we reduce the inequitable outcomes by focusing on investments in pre-disaster mitigation, such as hardening homes or preparing for floods? As climate impacts accelerate, how do we close insurance gaps so that communities have a capacity to recover? And how do we recruit nature as an ally by investing in urban greening, wetlands, and forest buffers that can protect communities from many catastrophic events? 
Those without insurance are the least able to bounce back after a wildfire disaster or a flood. And our urban residents and outdoor workers face increasing heat waves with fewer protections. The cost of not acting now will be astronomical for the state, in three areas in particular. We got a taste of the future when an atmospheric river flooded nearly 2,000 homes and businesses in Sonoma County two years ago, many of them without flood insurance. Flooding can be catastrophic, especially for renters who do not realize that they do not have coverage. All areas in the state are subject to at least some form of flooding. Since 1992, every county in California has been declared a federal disaster area at least once for a flooding event. Extreme heat waves last year increased emergency room visits for heat illness, especially among our Black, Asian American, and Latino communities where there are fewer parks and less relief from the heat. And there is no insurance that covers the impact of extreme heat beyond your health coverage. And of course, we are seeing the impact of wildfires on our rural residents and those in the wildland urban interface, where the number of insurance company cancellations increased 200% in areas with the highest risk. This has forced many people to find insurance that covers less and costs more, leaving especially our seniors and working families with less protections from future wildfires. I do not accept a future where climate change increases the gap between the wealthiest and the rest of us. I believe the efforts that you are working on today will have a major role in how we prepare and recover from climate impacts. By focusing on extreme heat, wildfires, as well as increased precipitation and flooding, my hope is that the assessment will enable better emergency preparedness, as well as investments in mitigation and planning. Thank you again for your excellent work. Well, we thank uh, Commissioner Lara for that. I really appreciate his taking the time to record that message. Uh, so the next thing we want to do is, is actually uh, go over the agenda. But before I do that, I want to just uh, offer some, some thanks and appreciation to everyone who helped us with this project. Uh, we had an advisory committee that met several times that helped us help guide the work uh, through its, from its inception through to today. Uh, we had a number of listening sessions, and we want to uh, I want to express my appreciation to those of you who shared your lived experience, your your knowledge, your expertise, and insights in those sessions. Uh, and also, we had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, with many of you, and we appreciate all of you sharing your your knowledge and wisdom. I also want to just thank, of course, our our consulting team led by Bureau Hapold and and the great work of Climate Resolve. And of course, my, my staff who collectively as a team have really guided this work to where we are today. So our agenda, and I'll be very brief because it is a very simple agenda. We're gonna provide you a bit of a, an overview of the project itself. Uh, we're gonna do a little uh, Mentimeter uh, introduction, uh, which you'll see what that is if you haven't experienced that before. We'll talk about the key findings. We'll leave plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, and then we'll talk about how, how you can use the, uh, the climate vulnerability assessment itself, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So with that, I will turn it over. Great, thank you, Gary. Hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Torres Pauling. I'm with the County of Los Angeles Chief Sustainability Office. Um, and I'm gonna go over what exactly uh, the climate vulnerability assessment is. And uh, let's move on to the next slide so I can start that. So why are we undertaking a climate vulnerability assessment? Um, it, well, because the County Board of Supervisors in 2019 uh, adopted um, the nation's most ambitious regional sustainability plan, our county. Uh, many of you are involved in that process. Um, and there are, it's not just in there once, it's in there twice. It's uh, doubly important uh, to undertake a climate vulnerability assessment. There are 159 actions in that plan. And um, the robustness of information that we felt would come out of a climate vulnerability assessment was, was so important that we had to specify um, that it really did two things, that a climate vulnerability assessment would 
look at the social um, vulnerabilities and also the physical vulnerabilities for our region. Um, this assessment would serve as a foundation to inform and help prioritize uh, climate adaptation and resilient action, resilience actions in the county. Um, so if you're looking in the plan, it's actions 28A and 28B. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there's climate vulnerability assessments out there. Why, what makes ours unique? Um, we have a really people-centered approach um, and that reflects in the R County plan. So that's filled into this climate vulnerability assessment. Um, we think a lot about the connection between the social, the people, the human-centered side, and the physical environment, um, and the vulnerabilities related to those two spaces. So you can see here in this picture, just to articulate some of those ideas, you see individuals um, going about their day, they're using an umbrella, they're in their community, presumably, um, interacting with the, with the space. Um, you see some shade trees, some lighting, some cars, so just thinking about how all those spaces um, relate in the context of, of climate change. Um, we also uniquely wanted to make this um, a project where we could hear from, and this is Gary uh, previewed this about listening sessions. We wanted to hear from groups who have been uh, systemically excluded or who have barriers to engaging in the decision-making processes um, related to climate uh, through these listening sessions. Um, how So that's process and approach. Um, what about the results? What do we think will make uh, the climate vulnerability assessment unique? Um, we're thinking about cascading impacts uh, about, so if a climate event occurs, how does that downstream impact um, people and, and places? Um, and also to really highlight that storytelling element. I'll explain more about that later. Um, and at the end, we hope it's used. <laughs> Sometimes this, these uh, types of assessments aren't used. So uh, hope that's unique and, and, and successful. Um, next slide, please. So to articulate more about the stakeholder engagement process, you are all part of it by participating today. Um, but we hope we had a fantastic advisory committee um, that was made up of 15 members from local government, utilities, um, the private sector, um, nonprofit organizations, and community-based organizations. Um, we have two uh, members of that advisory committee today who will share their experience, um, Sona Monat and Nareet Katz. Um, so thank you both for being here. Um, we held, um, and actually we have several other uh, folks on the line as, um, who are we're not presenting, but who are on our advisory committee. So thank you um, to you also for joining uh, today as well as participants. Um, we hosted, um, well, we are in the midst of hosting our second public workshop. Uh, we hosted one at the outset of this project and another um, today. We also hosted a convening for cities and we expect to do um, another convening for cities um, at a later date. We hosted those listening sessions that, that Gary referenced. Um, so we wanted to hear from hard to reach populations or, or or some populations that have barriers to engaging um, really specifically. So we hosted listening sessions for people experiencing homelessness, people without reliable transportation, um, outdoor workers, tribal and indigenous communities, rural communities, and people with disabilities and access challenges. Um, we also listened to um, experts in other spaces. Um, And lastly, of course, our webpage. Uh, next slide. Oh, and actually, I, you can stay on this slide, but just want to highlight that you will be hearing um, stories today from um, participants in that process. Um, so people who coped with heat waves and flooding, drought, wildfire hazards, we want to bring those stories to light um, you know, beyond what some of the data and analysis uh, could show. And, and recognize that there are data gaps. And that's why we really have this big emphasis on stories. So we thank those folks who are, have helped us uh, by sharing their stories that we'll be sharing with you today. Um, so if we are uh, back to the previous slide, um, what is, if you open up the climate vulnerability assessment when it's released, um, what will it look like? Um, it is four parts. It is a climate hazard assessment. 
a social vulnerability assessment, physical vulnerability assessment, then the assessment of cascading impact. So those are the sort of parts of a report um, that will be uh, uh, released at the end of this process shortly. Um, next slide, please. What is vulnerability? What is climate vulnerability? Um, we looked at a combination of factors to assess climate vulnerability. So it's sort of a short equation. I uh, considered how exposed a system, a community or a population is to a climate hazard, uh, the sensitivity or degree to which they are affected by the climate impact, and then the adaptive capacity or their ability to cope with those impacts. Um, so I think about it as sort of a sentence um, as an example. Wow, I was, it was 106 degrees today. That's my level of exposure. Um, I have a health condition where extreme heat is high, um, but I have access to air conditioning today. So that sentence together is my exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity. And next slide, please. Um, social vulnerability, what, is, what does that mean? Um, we do want to, we looked at a lot of different um, sources because uh, it's, it's not necessarily an intuitive concept. Um, so we wanted to highlight for folks who are interested in this topic, the 2017 Advancing Climate Justice in California, Guiding Principles and Recommendations for Policy and Funding Decisions report um, that was prepared by uh, the Climate Justice Working Group. Um, that as part of the 2017 Safeguarding California um, update process. So climate vulnerability is the result um, of climate change as experienced and the sensitivity to those impacts. Um, but that, that does not mean that it's about an individual sort of weakness or incapacity to, incapacity to cope, but it's sort of an indicator of factors, mostly sort of external and outside of an individual's control that make the, that person um, at risk for negative impacts. Um, and I'm sorry, I think we're having some issues with seeing the slides, uh, but I'll, I will, will, we will be posting uh, the slides. Um, yeah, so thanks. We'll, we'll change we, it, there we go. Okay, great. Um, and this is a wordy slide, so I wanna make sure folks can see this one in particular. Um, so these factors aren't necessarily, aren't include, but aren't just limited to inequities in education, health services, um, social capital, government support, bias, exclusion. Um, so these, these things that are beyond an individual's control. So it, it's, um, it's a nuanced concept. It's, it's not easy. So we're, we're, we really thank everybody who engaged with us on this. Um, it can be assessed quantitatively, qualitatively, a combo of both. Um, and, and that's really what we did. We did the a combination approach where we listened to the stories and then looked at the data as well. Um, we feel like folks have seen the slide. Okay, great. And um, so what exactly, what is the scope of what we looked at? Um, so again, sort of the people side and the infrastructure side, the populations that we examined, um, there are 29 indicators of, of uh, for populations that we examined. Um, we're not gonna list them all here, but they generally fall into these eight categories shown in those purple icons. So age and gender, occupation, for example. Um, infrastructure is the other side of the house of the scope. Um, that's the physical climate vulnerability examining um, over 40 different types of facilities. Um, those generally fall into 10 categories and those are on the right side of your screen uh, with red, those red icons. So communications, transportation, waste, for example. And that is the overview of the project. I will now hand it over to Chase, who is going to, to uh, lead us in a question on Mentimeter. Great, thank you, Kristen. Yeah, uh, so we have a survey platform that everyone can use. So if uh, folks haven't already, I believe we're going to drop a link in the chat or you can use your computer or phone and go to menti.com and enter the code that you see on the screen here, which is 9665886. 
um, and then answer the question. Um, I am going to now switch over to the results in real time. Um, so take one more look at that code if you need it. We can also drop that in the chat. And I will present the finding so far, but the question is, what component of the CVA are you interested in learning more about today? Uh, I recognize the text is a little small because we have a translation underneath it, uh, but one option is concrete examples of physical vulnerability. The next is concrete examples of social vulnerability. The third is narratives and stories about climate vulnerability. And then finally, the mapping platform. Um, so the mapping platform appears to be something that people are very interested in, um, along with concrete examples of physical vulnerability, but certainly uh, have folks in interested, that are interested in all of these uh, findings. So we'll give it a few more moments to update. Thank you for answering the survey. And I think with that, we can hand it back to the county to go over some of the key findings. Yes, and that would go back to Allie. Okay, great. Thank you, Chiefs and Natalie. Hi, everyone. I'm Allie Frazzini, also with the county's Chief Sustainability Office. And I'll tell you about some of our key findings. We assessed six specific hazards of climate change. So that's extreme heat, wildfire, drought, extreme precipitation and inland flooding and coastal flooding. We evaluated these hazards looking at impacts to LA County today and by mid-century under an RCP 8.5 scenario, which is uh, basically what will happen if um, climate pollution is not reduced significantly. This time frame, looking out to the next few decades, is particularly helpful for planning efforts and, and actions that we can take today. Next slide. This uh, chart shows the projected change in climate hazards in LA County between baseline and mid-century. Some hazards, such as heat and coastal flooding, will only increase. Other hazards, such as wildfire or precipitation, may see increases or decreases in different communities. However, the extremes are still anticipated to become more severe overall over time. Across all hazards, the projections indicate we'll be experiencing not only more frequent events, but also more severe and extreme events. So next I'll go through the hazards one by one to talk about specifically how they're expected to change, which communities or groups of people are most likely to be affected and what types of infrastructure are vulnerable. And I'll include findings from both our data analysis as well as our stakeholder engagement. Thank you, next slide. Uh, so starting with extreme heat. Extreme heat will have widespread impacts, uh, effects on people and infrastructure, increasing in uh, both frequency and severity across the county. Many areas that experience extreme heat will continue to see rising temperatures and areas that are highly vulnerable and will experience the highest change in temperature include the Northwest portion from San Fernando Valley up to Lancaster and Palmdale area, as well as the San Gabriel Valley. In total, over a million people in LA County live in areas where the average high temperature will increase more, uh, more than six degrees by mid-century, and where there'll be approximately 30 additional days per year that, that rise above historical highs. Extreme heat can impact a person's health and well-being in many different ways. Uh, in addition to causing heat stroke and related illnesses, it can trigger other conditions such as asthma and heart attacks. So people with pre-existing health conditions are particularly susceptible to the impacts from extreme heat. It can also impact pregnancies and infant health, as well as mental health and cognitive function. And people who are exposed to extreme heat while doing physical labor are more prone not just to the illness, but also to injury. So when we analyzed uh, the rise in extreme heat in LA County, we looked at where that's occurring most intensely and which vulnerable groups will be most affected based on where they live. We found that high proportions of people with pre-existing conditions, children and older adults and outdoor workers live in the areas where heat is increasing the most. 
When we engaged group, uh, groups that represented outdoor workers to understand the risks and impacts to them in greater detail, we heard that many employers see heat as a stressor, not a real hazard. And many workers fear that if they report heat related incident, uh, incidents, their employers will retaliate. A lot of these workers are low income and can't afford to turn down or lose work, even in dangerous conditions. And just as an example of how extreme these conditions can get, one person who works in a warehouse setting said that their sweat would sizzle as it hit the floor while unloading and loading shipping containers. Even though we weren't able to map the exposure of people experiencing homelessness, we know that they are also extremely vulnerable due to high exposure with people dying on the street during heat waves. And lastly, with more than 5 million county residents who rent their home, it's important to acknowledge that renters have elevated risk during extreme heat because they're less likely to be able to keep their indoor temperatures cool. And almost a full third of renters live in areas with high heat exposure. By mid-century, this number could double to two thirds. And so now just to touch on the physical infrastructure side of heat, some facilities in every major categories of infrastructure have at least moderate vulnerability to it. Energy infrastructure and parks and open space, which are both all critical um, for helping people cope with heat and are also, uh, they're also highly vulnerable to extreme heat. Regarding energy, the increased demand for cooling and air conditioning during extreme heat can lead to strain on electrical infrastructure and potential outages. Transmission lines in particular, as you, <laughs> what you see here, um, are, are sensitive. Um, the material expands due to rising temperatures and that can cause lines to sag, creating fire and safety hazards. And higher resistance in conductor strands can reduce transmission efficiency, basically affecting the overall electrical grid. Lastly, parks and open spaces, an essential asset uh, that you know, came up throughout our stakeholder engagement, they provide important recreation opportunities, serve as a cooling resource um, you know, for people seeking relief from extreme heat. Uh, they are important for climate resilience in a variety of ways, including opportunities for social cohesion, mental health benefits, and stormwater management. But they are also highly sensitive to extreme heat because heat can harm the vegetation there, um, as well as increase the likelihood of, of things like insect infestations. I'm gonna try and slow down a little bit, getting a, a note from the interpreter. Uh, moving on to wildfire, we can go to the next slide. We project that an additional 2.2 hectares of LA County land will burn each year by mid-century. Wildfire, of course, can cause intense direct harm, including risk of injury, damage to property and infrastructure, and of course, mental and emotional health impacts to the people affected. The proportion of the total county population affected by these direct impacts is relatively small, but the smoke from wildfires impacts the entire region with 40% of the population uh, having reported that they avoided going outside due to smoke in, in the past year. Next slide. To go into a little more detail about these vulnerabilities, uh, our analysis showed that the areas vulnerable to direct impacts of wildfire include high proportions of older adults living alone, people with limited access to transportation, and people with cardiovascular disease. When we spoke with stakeholders about this hazard, we heard that it's extremely important to have emergency and evacuation plans that specifically support certain subpopulations, such as people with disabilities or those who rely on caretakers and people experiencing homelessness. One stakeholder said, there are no clear indications of where a power share user like myself should go to evacuate. Any place I go would need to have a disabled accessible bathroom, which I can use, and which would be large enough for a large power chair to fit in. Also the transportation would have to accommodate my power chair, which is about 400 pounds without me even in it. Uh, it would be great if there was someone knowledgeable about dealing with disabilities to coordinate our response. Otherwise, we have to trust that we'll be lucky enough to stumble upon the best way forward when disaster strikes. When it comes to infrastructure, uh, communications infrastructure, which of course is important to facilitate evacu evacuations, is itself vulnerable to increasing wildfire exposure. In the county, more than a third of cell towers are located in areas with inc increasing exposure to wildfire by mid-century. 
Wildfire may also reduce water quality in lakes, storage reservoirs, rivers, and streams due to soot, erosion, and, and sedimentation, which in turn can impact water quality and uh, result in increased costs for treatment and sediment removal. Additional infrastructure types that are in areas of high wildfire exposure uh, are particularly vulnerable, like energy infrastructure and major power transmission lines, uh, bringing energy in from and out of the basin. Uh, next slide. So now transitioning the focus to risk of flooding, even though we associate LA County with a scarcity of water, this region also has a history of devastating floods and extreme precipitation will likely make this worse in the future. Where the flooding occurs is influenced by topography and floodplains, so we used FEMA flood maps to estimate what the impact could be. But unfortunately, these maps don't take projected change in precipitation into account. We don't have climate projections for inland flooding, and there's a strong need for research to fill that gap. So just want to acknowledge that up front. Um, but the flood prone, prone zones, uh, you know, we do know they include areas within river floodplains or adjacent to drainage systems. Uh, low-lying areas where heavy rainfall can collect and areas with inadequate storm drain infrastructure. Flooding can create damage to buildings, structure, and pavement due to inundation and erosion. And like with all other hazards, many of the people who would be directly impacted by this are folks who lack the resources that they might need to recover. Next slide. Nearly a third of people living in mobile homes and, and people living in group quarters are exposed to, to flood risk. Uh, additionally, many people experiencing homelessness are in high flood risk areas. When we engaged homeless service organizations to understand this risk better, we heard about a rainstorm in Alamante that just uh, completely submerged the bridge that people used to cross the creek to get to an encampment. That's the picture you see here. Since people couldn't cross the bridge, those living in the encampment completely lost access to supports and services that are critical on a day-to-day -day basis. Potential impacts to our physical infrastructure includes damage to buildings, roads, electrical equipment, of course, in addition to bridges. Um, and, and that damage to electrical equipment uh, can lead to uh, loss of power, and of course, other damages can lead to road closures. Some roadway types are particularly sensitive, like bridges where flooding can pile debris on decks and pose a safety hazard, or tunnels where water could pool more significantly than on open roadways. And damage to electrical and HVAC equipment in, in buildings can result in equipment failure and potential loss of power as well, uh, which of course disrupts services and operations, potentially um, impacting businesses and economic centers. Next slide. And now to talk about coastal flooding. Um, it will have a, a, a somewhat localized direct impact. Some areas of the coast will experience exposure to coastal flooding by mid-century with uh, potential flooding of heights as high as four feet in certain areas around Malibu, Marina del Rey, and Long Beach. And even more than four feet in some areas near the port of Long Beach. Next slide. Across the LA County coast, there are roughly 47,000 people at risk of coastal flooding by mid-century, um, and among those, low-income people may have a harder time recovering. Um, as the shoreline moves up, we'll also lose beach and recreation space, directly impacting county residents who use that space, as well as um, tourism, of course, and a variety of, of businesses. Coastal infrastructure such as roads and bike paths will flood, and the LA and Long Beach ports will see impacts to on-site goods movement which has potential to cause widespread economic repercussions uh, in the region. Next slide. Lastly, we'll talk about drought. Uh, as shown here with data from the US Drought Monitor, we experienced severe drought just a few years ago here in California and LA County. And as the lines start to redden again in 2021, we are once again starting to face extreme drought conditions. Increases in coincident low precipitation and warm years throughout California and the Western US will likely increase the risk of severe droughts. Over the Southwest US, climate models project more than a 65% increase in the chance of mega drought between mid and in century um, relative to, to baseline. 
drought has a, a widespread impact on people and infrastructure, and uh, these periods will continue to lengthen and worsen. Communities that rely on a single source of water or have small water service providers are most vulnerable to the impacts of drought. Next slide. Drought threatens flora that are medicinally and, and culturally important to indigenous communities as well, such as reed plants. Um, and rural communities noted many complications with drought, including reductions in irrigated landscape resulting in more heat and dust, competition for water between agricultural and residential uses, uh, and um, the action of, of uh, wetting the ground that uh, to prevent the spreading of dust, actually creating more spores that spread valley, valley fever, a, a dangerous condition experienced up there. There's also real concern about lack of water availability for small water systems in, in particular, as I mentioned, um, and the extent of water as it becomes more scarce. It is likely that some wells will run dry and as we become dependent on groundwater, groundwater tables lower and the risk of contamination increases. Droughts can also reduce uh, power generation from hydropower. And finally, damage or loss of vegetation in parks and open spaces, uh, including increased susceptibility of um, vegetation uh, to invasive pests um, are also a concern. So hope, hope you held on for that whole key finding section. Thank you. And I'll pass it off to Chase, I believe. Yeah, thank you, Ali. Um, so we have another Mentimeter question for you all. I need to activate it for you, but just a reminder to go to menti.com and enter 9665886. Um, and I will open up that second question. which is what climate impacts on vulnerable populations are you most concerned about? This is an open-ended question. Um, and you can see we have some answers coming in. So these will start to scroll as people have a time to answer. So heat um, is certainly top of mind for a lot of people. We also see wildfire, health risks from increased heat. Um, so heat is, definitely a prevailing thing. Some folks are concerned about many conditions, drought, wildfire, and heat, um, powder outage, population displacement, heart attack, water scarcity, mm -hmm. um, pregnant women and premature birth, um, a lot more heat, air quality, also a concern. Um, and we have all others rely on quality mapping and spatial analysis. So uh, recognizing that we need to understand where these threats are coming from. Folks are worried about um, older adults living alone, heat and wildfires for workers, drought, wildfire, um, all of them tied together. Yeah, so quite a few people also mentioning um, about how these threats interlace and affect one another. Um, we will be sure to share um, some of this feedback as well. And with that, I will pass it back to um, the team. Uh, so that looks like me now. Um, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jessica Rubinsky. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the cascading impacts. Uh, when the climate changes. So the infrastructure that's at risk from climate change is part of a complex system. We need water to generate energy. We need energy to move water. And we want to take those complexities into account. Um, so what we did was to map the interdependencies among different critical infrastructure sectors in LA County, um, including the ones you see in different colors here. Um, on the left, water, wastewater, and stormwater in blue, electricity in yellow, communications in green, transportation, and continuing up off screen, emergency services, public health and health services, and fuel. Um, so we went around asking each sector what they need from the other sectors in order to function well. What are your dependencies? What are your outputs? Um, and in the diagram you're looking at, uh, the arrows are causes. Um, don't try to read the little letters. Um, all you can really see at this scale is that infrastructure sectors are highly interdependent. 
And what that means is that when one sector goes down, others can follow. Um, for example, if you zoom in on one path in the systems map, you can see that when the battery backups, when the battery, when the backup batteries at cell towers run out, that goes on to affect first responder availability, as Susan mentioned in the chat, but also in other ways. Um, so it's not just the direct impacts that matter. Um, this is only one of actually tens to hundreds of thousands of paths in this model. Um, so rather than looking at it one by one, we can analyze the structure of the network as a whole to see how the system functions and to learn things like which physical infrastructure matters most in terms of its downstream effects on other infrastructure. Um, you may not be surprised to hear that electricity is critical. Um, the summary diagram shows the strength of connection between individual sectors. So the thicker the line between sectors in this diagram, the, and you can move on to the next slide. Um, the higher the number, oh, and the next slide. Sorry. <laughs> um, you, you missed the single path. You would have been able to read that one. Um, okay. Uh, so basically this, the thickness of the arrows here is counting up the number of little arrows in the systems map. Um, and so you can see here on the right, I'm actually looking at what you're looking at now, um, that electricity influences every other sector shown here in many different ways. And that's also borne out by the social network analysis metrics um, in the, which we ran on the systems map. Um, and there the node electrical power provision has by far the highest number of direct connections, most of them outgoing. It has the highest degree and out degree centrality. Um, which is to say that electricity is critical, not just for the services that it provides, but for the ways in which all the other sectors rely on it. Um, including water, um, which uh, we use energy to move and treat and heat water. Um, and you can see in the top left here, uh, it's, it's the same diagram I was showing you before, but I've highlighted the, the water energy nexus. Because water is actually just as necessary for producing energy as energy is for producing water. Um, which means that water, aside from being 60% you know, of our body weight and critical for hospitals, it also has all the same downstream effects that electricity does. So since electricity generation depends on water availability, a water outage, um, whether it's from an earthquake or drought, could disrupt electricity, and therefore everything that depends on electricity. Um, on electricity. So, and, oh, and while backup power is, is at the sort of the top of everybody's mind these days, not a lot of facilities have backup water storage. And Susan is saying, and pump wa uh, water from the private wells we rely on, yes. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, transportation and communications are important too, um, not just because we like to get places and we like to talk to people, but like electricity because of the many ways in which all other sectors rely on them. Transportation and communications uh, have the second and third highest out degree centrality or number of direct outgoing connections. Uh, and then on the next slide, every, every critical infrastructure feeds in, critical infrastructure sector feeds into our health and safety. Um, and this, this is the next slide. Um, so good community function uh, or human health and well being and livelihoods is both the ultimate goal of the critical lifelines working well together. And it's also the necessary element that keeps them working well, which is to say that it feeds back to reinforce other infrastructure sectors. When the community is functioning well, when people are healthy and safe, then essential workers who operate and maintain the infrastructure in this map can continue to ensure that the community keeps functioning well. I may have said that a little fast, sorry. Um, in fact, one of the, okay. In fact, one of the most important findings from the network analysis is that workers are central. Uh, and this is kind of obvious in retrospect, but we weren't modeling workers. 
uh, we were looking at asphalt, we were looking at wires. And what the analysis showed us is that workforce availability mediates almost every interaction in the network. It has the highest, what's called betweenness centrality, which means that if you take uh, any two nodes and look at the shortest path between those two nodes, the node that is most likely to be on that path is workforce availability. Um, the, the, yep, that slide, thank you. <laughs> um, so this diagram that you're looking at now shows a small piece of the big map um, and including a few elements that are really key to the system's behavior. In the middle there are the three nodes with the very highest eigenvector centrality and that means that they're the most connected nodes including all the indirect connections. It's the same measure that Google uses, one of the measures that Google uses to determine a, a web page's rank. Um, so the three nodes with the highest eigenvector centrality are, or most connected nodes are community function, public health, and workforce availability. Um, and workforce availability also appears in a lot of reinforcing feedback loops. Now I'll walk through an example of that, but what that means is that things that affect workers have an exponential impact on the system. So in a reinforcing feedback loop, the worse something gets, the worse it gets. It's like it can snowball out of control. So if for example, flooding impacts bus reliability, so look on the far right of the diagram now, um, that can throw off the timing of connections throughout the transit system and it can impact mobility and accessibility which means that many more people don't get to work. And maybe some of those people were bus drivers, um, which would throw the transit system even more out of whack and cause more people to miss work. And while the workforce availability is going down and down and down, they weren't all bus drivers who, who couldn't get into work. Maybe some of them work in electricity. And if that were to make the lights go out, then there's the potential for another reinforcing feedback loop. People can't do their work now because the power is out. Um, there are actually thousands of such reinforcing feedback loops containing workforce availability in this map. Um, so workers are essential, not just to the services that they provide directly, but to the functioning of the entire community system. Uh, and if we go on to the next slide, um, what matters about all these infrastructure impacts is how they affect people. Um, so in the listening sessions that you've heard about uh, and some key informant interviews, one of the things that we asked was what happens to people when services fail? Um, and this slide lists some of the things that we heard. It's, it's not a comprehensive list by any means. And actually, Ali has mentioned some of them already. Um, so I will barely touch on them, uh, given the time. Uh, energy disruptions can disproportionately impact socially vulnerable populations. During climate disasters, there are a lot of people who aren't getting critical emergency messaging, and there are probably some things we could do about that. Um, evacuation can be extremely difficult for people with disabilities, for people without reliable transportation, um, and for rural communities, especially when the power's out, so the internet's down, you can't get the list, latest fire information. Um, it's also, uh, part, also really important are parks and open space and trees and access to cooling infrastructure. Uh, and as I've been emphasizing, there is a reinforcing feedback loop between the impacts of climate related infrastructure disruption on workers and the reliance on workers to maintain that infrastructure. So the big takeaway for me here uh, is that even when we thought we were studying infrastructure, it turned out that people were the most critical factor. None of it works without people and none of it matters without people. So this is a vulnerability assessment, but when it comes time to prioritize infrastructure for adaptation, we don't just wanna know what's most vulnerable, but also what's most important, what should we protect? And one of the ways that we can start to get at that is through these connections, these cascading consequences. Um, Infrastructure is important for the services that rely on it and for the people who rely on those services. And I'll pass it over to Chase. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, 
Thanks, Sorry, man. apologies. Um, thank you, Jessica. Once again, we'll be going over to Mentimeter. Um, we'll be dropping the link and information in the chat. Um, but we would like to know what infrastructure are you most concerned about in Los Angeles County when it comes to climate change? So, uh, we will wait for responses to come in. That question again was what infrastructure are you most concerned about? Um, so we see energy and water as key themes, as we saw in that feedback loop. Um, lots of, yeah, electricity, water supply, um, gas pipeline ready for hydrogen. Um, people are concerned about workers. Um, electricity and water, uh, yeah, are certainly um, prominent here. And we're seeing also roads, bridges, tunnels, transportation, uh, trees, uh, water and electricity again and again, above ground power transmission. So some specifics about um, our energy infrastructure, also seeing caretakers um, noting uh, about how that in integrates with uh, the workforce, um, reliable access to public transportation, um, energy resiliency, more trees, uh, wastewater systems, getting more specific with uh, water as well. So thank you uh, for participating in this poll and sharing your feedback. And I will hand it uh, back over to the team. Thank you, Chase. Hi, everyone. Ed Axelrad, consultant with Bureau Happold. And I'll briefly introduce uh, one of our next steps in this project, which is to construct an interactive online mapping platform. The goal of this tool is to increase literacy and provide additional capacity for exploration of CVA results. The tool will allow users to examine layer details in combinations not otherwise provided in the final report. We have an initial map concept here that you see on the right hand side. And it includes a few key elements like search and zoom features up in the left there, layer details upon selection. So you'd be able to see things like population, community name, demographics, and sensitivity indicator values. And then lastly, on the right-hand side, we have a menu for toggling layers on and off, switching base maps and boundary layers like planning areas and districts. And with that, I will hand it back over to CSO and Rita for Q&A. Wonderful. Hi, this is Kristen again. Um, I'm going to um, lift up some questions uh, that we received in the chat. Um, and I will start with um, a question about lack, um, access, language access and um, communication. So we point out, um, I think Valerie raised this question about, um, we talked about communications, but didn't discuss language access. Um, would the team be able to sort of describe what we meant when we showed communications and where language access shows up in the CBA? Uh, Ali or sorry, who did? <laughs> um, just yeah, definitely acknowledge that language language access is critical to this, um, especially with. You know, I think many of the vulnerable populations um, needing to to receive uh, you know messages and communications uh, in languages other than English. Um, so uh, we didn't intend to underemphasize that here. It will definitely be um, flagged within the larger report. Great, thank you. Um, and then we also have. Um, I'm just uh, invite folks so you can go ahead and type any questions that you wanted to um, have the speakers address now. Um, and then we had some questions from Susan about mapping, about what will the map cover? Um, will the map cover the North County as well? Maybe Eden, would you want to take that one? Yeah, of course. Uh, I answered that one in the chat, but the map will cover the entire county. So we'll be able to see the North County as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then another um, 
question we've gotten uh, several times, um, but I do want to um, just uh, let folks respond here about um, where will the slides and recording uh, be available and, and when we might also answer that question. Um, Allie, would you mind taking that one? Uh, I uh, don't know the exact date. Um, I believe we're aiming to make the slides available by next week. Does someone want to correct me on that? <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's a safe uh, safe one. And um, the recording usually takes about that amount of time um, or less to get up as well. Um, and then I guess uh, another timing question about when is the CBA going to be done and completed? Yes, so um, we uh, are uh, taking uh, most of the summer to continue fleshing this out and um, developing a full report with more details and, and tools that you know, um, will be uh, usable by all you, uh, by, all, by everyone. And um, so we're aiming to put it out in August. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and that includes the map. Um, the mapping, uh, correct? Because we have a question about that. That's right, yes, yes including the mapping. Okay, um, let's see, how much time do we have here for questions? Um, no answer, maybe one more question. Um, I see there's a question here from um, John about, um, we didn't hear a discussion around climate gentrification and climate migration and refugees when addressing affordable housing um, and and homelessness. Um, do we want to talk about the um, that piece about climate um, and movement of people in the relationship to housing? I think um, what we can say about that, um, you know, it's I, we didn't develop any projections or predictions of how populations might change um, over time, but we know that's likely, and um, that's going to be an incredibly important consideration for our climate adaptation and climate resilience work. Um, you know, for the purposes of this assessment, uh, again, we were, it was, you know, we weren't looking at uh, specific interventions or trying to decide what, what or how to do them. Um, we were really looking first at the risks, um, but as we continue into that climate adaptation work, um, that is an, a really important consideration and we hope that people keep bringing it up. Um, and then uh, let's, oh wow, lots of questions coming in. Um, is there an opportunity to include business groups um, in the updates? So um, yeah, Ali or, or Rita wanna talk about what we've done to um, include business groups so far and, and how we might, uh, opportunities for connecting with us in the future. Rita, do you wanna take that one? I think you've engaged with them more than I have. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah, sure I can. Well, I'll, I'll just mention we had a technical advisory committee and we did include, have representation from uh, businesses in, in LA and uh, as well as invites to this workshop, but always happy to um, hear more input from groups as we go forward. But yes, we do consider that obviously a very important perspective to this work. Great, thank you. Um, and moving up in the questions, will um, how will we address and prioritize data gaps that need to be filled in order to more accurately define accurately define climate vulnerabilities and the actions needed to address them? Um, yeah, Ali, you want to take uh, the data sure. gaps question? Yeah, we we have been you know making a note of all the the gaps that we come across and things that we wish we knew and. Um, our office, uh, you know, actively seeks out partnerships with researchers. Uh, I think we are uh, currently trying to foment a number of <laughs> research ideas, um, and so we uh, we will um, definitely make that information available. Great, thank you. Um, and um, let me see. There is a question around um, the county sort of a land development process and the relationship between the county's sort of current planning and um, related to land use and wildfire. Um, looking at developments like Tahone, uh, Tahone Ranch. Um, Gary, do you wanna take uh, that question? 
Sure, and I, I, this is this is a, a, a difficult question, of course, because uh, land use is governed by the general plan. The, the sustainability plan itself, though, does seek ways to identify uh, um, tools, policies, programs that we could implement to uh, discourage uh, development in uh, in high fire hazard areas. Uh, we've actually been working on. Uh, investigating the use of, say, a transfer of development rights or transfer of floor area uh, ratio rights um, from high hazard areas to lower hazard areas uh, as, a, as a potential innovative approach to the question. But um, we certainly agree that, uh, that we should limit uh, development in these areas and we need to identify the appropriate uh, tools that we can bring to bear to, to do that. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I think that's, I'm seeing sort of a theme of questions about sort of how will we use this assessment, um, sort of from a land use perspective, from a urban tree canopy perspective. Um, so I think we can transition and I'll say that q and is, is not closed. Um, we have uh, our sustainability um, inbox where you can reach us at any time on this or any other topic. Um, and uh, we can um, answer any further questions there. We're always happy to discuss um, but we will move into the section on, um, and there it is in the chat, we'll move on to the section about um, how to use the CBI. Um, so let me uh, pause there and move on to um, introducing uh, Nareet Katz um, from UCLA. Oh, actually, sorry, let me, let me pass it over to, to Natalie who will introduce Nareet. You, you were good, Kristen. I think Nareet, are you ready to start? All right, if Nareet's ready, we'll pass it over to Nareet and introduce her slide here is uh, the Chief Sustainability Officer for uh, for UCLA. Yeah, thank you. Is the audio okay? You can hear me all right? Great, so um, as, as uh, Kristen mentioned, I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for UCLA. Um, I work across the organization in a variety of topics, one of which is resilience. Um, as you can kind of get a sense of in this photo, UCLA is a very large institution. We're actually um, kind of more like a small city ourselves. So daily population is about 80,000 people. Um, so when we approach resilience planning, you know, we really look to our local government colleagues for kind of best practices. Um, so I'm working with my colleagues across the UC, 10 different University of California campuses right now on a project that's specifically focused on climate resilience and climate vulnerabilities. Um, we're gonna be doing a couple of workshops this summer and we're really trying to center that planning process in JEDI or Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, so this uh, county vulnerabilities assessment is uh, hugely important for us. It's really, you know, I've found and, and I've seen uh, in the field that you really can't do resilience planning in a vacuum. Um, it really has to be considered in a regional context. So to be able to have all this incredible information that was gathered uh, through the CVA is gonna be really valuable in our planning process. And I've invited a member of the team to speak to our internal stakeholders at this workshop. So um, just here today to share that with you, you know, I, I definitely think it's worthwhile to try and um, do this type of planning on an organization level, whether you're a big organization like UCLA or a large company, or you're with a small company or a small organization, um, you know, thinking about your own ability to respond to shocks and stressors, especially those caused by global climate change, um, will really help uh, prepare you. And um, I think the CVA can be a really good tool to kind of center that framework in a regional context. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and Nareet, thank you so much for your time and sharing the, the context of the relationships um, with the UC system and how local governments uh, plan for this. Um, so next we'll move to introducing um, Sona Monat from um, the Greenlining Institute, um, also an advisory committee member. Um, she is their associate director of climate equity. Uh, Sona, let's hear about your thoughts on how to use the climate vulnerability assessment. Thanks, Kristen, and uh, thanks for inviting me to share some thoughts today. Um, yeah, as Kristen mentioned, Green Landing participated as a member of the advisory committee to help inform the CVA 
Um, and for those who don't know, Green Lining is a racial and economic justice uh, public policy organization based in Oakland. And we do statewide advocacy in California to work to address the impacts that redlining created in low-income communities of color in the state. Um, and we really appreciate all the work that the county is doing to address climate vulnerabilities. And I just wanted to speak to two things briefly today. Uh, first, I wanted to uplift the CVA's intentionality around connecting both the physical and social vulnerability findings to really get a comprehensive picture of who is most vulnerable to different climate impacts. And I think the CVA does more than just sharing the different physical and social vulnerability findings, but really providing a clear narrative on how they're connected. And right now, um, I'm just thinking about the extreme heat wave that is hitting uh, communities in the Pacific Northwest right now. And in Portland, uh, the Public Transit Authority had to suspend light rail service because the power cables were melting and it cut off uh, critical transportation access for many uh, low-income communities and impacted people who might not be able to get to work or to other places that they need to go to. Um, and so, this has been on my mind and I'm just thinking about, you know, the more that we can see how impacts to physical infrastructure like transportation, but also energy, housing, communications and other um, physical infrastructure that the CVA covers, how that impacts socially vulnerable communities, then the better equipped will be to develop proactive strategies and policies to address these impacts on communities and design these solutions to meet the specific needs of a community. And on this point, um, designing solutions that meet community identified needs is something that I wanted to emphasize. Uh, the CVA uh, or the whole process, they held listening sessions, as was mentioned, with different members of socially vulnerable populations, including workers, um, folks without reliable transportation, uh, rural communities, um, and others. And we think this is really critical when doing vulnerability assessments. Um, it really gets to the community engagement piece of it. Um, information from quantitative indicators should be complemented with the types of experiential knowledge and stories from community residents through ground truthing processes like listening sessions, but there's a number of other uh, ways to do this to capture what can't be quantified well, um, and to also learn about you know, what is already happening in communities, what solutions are they already developing to address um, the different types of uh, climate impacts they might be experiencing. And so I think this can help ensure that the development and application application of a CVA are inclusive, representative, and really participatory to hopefully generate very well-informed decisions. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to quickly share uh, is that Greenlining and the Asian Pacific Environmental Network have been working with the Office of Planning and Research, um, or OPR, to develop a statewide mapping platform to identify communities most impacted by climate change threats. Um, the goal is for the tool to provide information to help policymakers um, and others make targeted policy and investment decisions uh, that can help communities that are um, being hit hardest by climate change disasters. And so we see the work being done here through this CVA as a great model for the statewide mapping tool, um, and we hope to use it to inform the tool, uh, particularly in how it connects the physical and social vulnerability piece. Uh, so thank you, and I'll turn it back over to you, Kristen. Thank you so much, Sona. Um, we appreciate both your and Narit's um, leadership on the advisory committee and your time today. Um, next slide. Um, we have I think we're already generating in the chat lots of ideas about um, ways that um, both the county and stakeholders could um, use this, this climate vulnerability assessment. Um, and just one piece uh, about some other examples of how, how could um, organizations both at the county and um, outside of the county use the climate vulnerability assessment. Um, so we have some ideas here. Um, these are just some ideas. Informing um, grant applications when applying for funding, um, helping to prioritize hazard mitigation, planning, public health policies, emergency preparedness, land use planning, infrastructure investment, a lot of topics that have been brought up in the chat so far. Um, and that was envisioned in the R County Sustainability Plan. That was part of the, um, the goal of uh, conducting this assessment. Um, we can, the climate vulnerability assessment can help with cities as they do their own city adaptation planning um, um, and programming. Um, and one very specific piece 
is uh, supporting municipalities as they comply with state law, which is uh, Senate Bill 379, which requires that local governments update part of their general plan to consider um, our what we know the future will hold from, from climate change and to prepare for those vulnerabilities. Um, so we have done some of the work for, for cities. So we very much um, hope that the, what we've done is useful for that process. Um, let us move to our next slide, which is Chase with the Mentimeter. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Um, so now we'd like to hear from you all about uh, first what you think the county should do with the CBA report and tool. Um, so once again, you can go to menti.com and enter the code. Um, and we'll see answers coming in. Instructions um, will be posted in the chat. Um, so let us know what you think and we'll take a look at what you have to say in real time here. So allow me to open that up for everybody. So now you should be able to answer this question. Uh, what should the county do with the CVA report and tool? And if for any reason you cannot access the Mentimeter, feel free to put your answer in the chat, which is what should the county do with the CVA report and tool? Um, and that's just really what we want to get at um, at the end of the session, um, hearing how the county can take all this information that was just presented and make it useful. Great. So we have some initial answers coming. The first one to share with the public. Good news is that will definitely happen. Um, take adaptation and mitigation measures, dedicate resources and money where they're most needed. Um, make sure to publish it online so it's accessible. Um, having each uh, department evaluate it against their own work plans, uh, lobbying at the state Can level. Slow down a little bit. Sorry. Yes. Uh, lobbying at the state level to make a case for projects that address sustainability on a regional scale, uh, guiding future research questions and RFPs, um, stopping development in high risk areas, um, sharing with local jurisdictions uh, staff, um, resource implementation of climate solutions, uh, creating a climate adaptation plan as a first step in building implementation projects. Um, and we have some more coming in, um, informing budget priorities um, and sharing it with county leaders to create a county leader meeting to develop new policies for LA, um, stopping sprawl development and directing funds to infill development. Uh, using it to help craft a plan to help marginalized people's evacuation plans. So a lot of really great ideas coming in. I think uh, we can move to the next question. Um, so if you're still on your device here, um, it will now open up. Once again, the instructions are the same. You can go to menti.com and enter the code uh, that you see above um, and the question is how will you use the CVA report and tool? So you um, as either an individual or an organization, um, if it is applicable, how do you plan on using the report and tool? So we've had some really good ideas so far. Um, do you have any other uh, thoughts here? So informing a company strategy, sharing it with your community, creating dialogue and solutions to advocate for necessary changes. Um, some people um, are not certain, but they're putting it on their next meeting agenda. So yeah, asking people in your community what you would like to do um, with the CVA, um, share it with your city to help them update your general plan, uh, comparing it to other climate vulnerability assessments. Yeah, sharing it with internal teams, informing philanthropic investment. So in the same way that some people are using this to apply for money, uh, perhaps funders are now using this to inform their funding, which would be a nice connection. Um, following its implementation, 
and then advocating for infrastructure funding. So thank you again, everybody. These are all um, really, really great ideas. Uh, and with that, I will hand it back to uh, the team to conclude. Yeah, and that's my cue. So um, certainly I uh, want to say, you know, this is just barely scratched the surface of what's in the uh, in the climate vulnerability assessment. And we're looking forward to being able to share with you the full assessment and digging into the mapping and all the rest of it uh, as soon as we can, because there is an awful lot there. And, and in an hour and a half, we obviously couldn't cover all of it. So this was really meant to be uh, a high level overview and introduction to it. And um, I think you'll all be able to find parts of it to work with and continue to inform your own work just as we will in the county use it to inform our work. And, and that really goes to one of the other questions that uh, or comments that we got um, from uh, Kathy Schaefer uh, and Sam Block had, uh, had seconded that, which is, you know, this will not include uh, actually a specific list of recommendations. What this really is meant to be is simply what it's called. It's an assessment. It's meant to be an informational document that will then help inform future planning processes, future programs, future uh, policy development. And uh, we in the county will take it um, uh, and, and start to develop now a, a climate adaptation plan, but that's not just the only thing we're going to be using it for. We're going to use it for uh, any number of our efforts around emergency response, uh, informing our work as we go forward. So it really is meant to be uh, uh, an informational document that will that will help us get to the next step. And, and we're already brainstorming innovative ideas uh, given that this really did focus, I think Kristen pointed out a couple of times, uh, as well as Ali, on people, um, really thinking about how we can use the climate vulnerability assessment to design uh, policies and programs that will help uh, protect our communities from, from climate hazards. So the other uh, comment I wanted to um, make is that you know, it is, and I said this at the beginning, but I will say it again, uh, you know, what's in here, uh, and I think uh, Ali pointed out is RCP um, representative concentration for, um, I can never remember the acronym, but RCP 8.5, which, you know, is a, a bit of a worst case scenario, and it doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to live a worst case scenario. We have the power to actually get us to a better future than what is included in this vulnerability assessment. But for the purposes of planning, we felt it was important to, uh, to take that RCP 8.5, that uh, essentially worst case scenario, uh, and, and allow that to inform future policy and planning processes. So um, I would encourage all of you, just as we will work in the county, to actually take action uh, today immediately to start uh, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, stop uh, putting uh, climate pollution into the atmosphere and really uh, driving uh, action that will, that will bend the curve, as they say, um, to reduce the impacts of climate change on our, on our communities and of course on our, our physical infrastructure. So with that, I would just wanna final uh, wrap up by saying thanks to everybody uh, for being here today. It was great to have such a large crowd. Uh, it was great to have such an engaged crowd. The, the Mentimeter responses were fantastic. The questions were great. Um, just the comments that were flowing in the chat were wonderful and we really appreciated you all taking time uh, this afternoon to spend an hour and a half with us to, to, to hear about the climate vulnerability assessment. And I, uh, I was heartened to, to see some of those responses on taking it back into your own uh, organizations and communities uh, and figuring out how to use its results to, 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 to drive change within, within your own programs and policies. 
So with that, I will just say thanks, everyone. Uh, have a great rest of your afternoon and a safe and happy 4th of July. Take care, everybody.